But the thing that really strikes me in the connection with conservation is that all of these people that you're mentioning, the saving the desert rat or a butterfly or uh, you know, whatever, or working on climate or trying to develop a biodegradable solutions for the plastics problem, all of those are quintessential examples of the hero's journey. Uh, and uh, so they really lend themselves to storytelling and to not take advantage of that when people process stories and stories stick with people in a way that that facts just don't. So you really, so the, the whole idea of telling the stories of these successes, I think is absolutely critical. Welcome to The Possibilists. The Possibilists is a podcast collaboration between the Smithsonian Earth Optimism and Pelicanus. The Smithsonian Conservation Commons Earth Optimism Initiative is changing the conservation narrative from one that focuses on problems and perils to highlighting impactful solutions. By celebrating what's working in conservation, they seek to inspire action and move global community from a sense of loss to one of hope and finding solutions to save our planet. Pelicanus is a conservation-based collective and continuous wonder of the healing and encouragement that is possible on this planet and the people making it happen. We are committed to telling these stories and demonstrating optimism through science. Now in this partnership, we spotlight conservationists working with a possibilistic attitude for solution-based efforts to tackle the world's critical environmental struggles. We're attempting to reframe the narrative around conservation to show that conservation successes are possible through changes in attitude and implementation of intentional change. This episode is a discussion with Dr. Nancy Knowlton. Dr. Knowlton is a coral reef scientist that has worked in conservation ever since the 1970s. She has contributed to the scientific knowledge, conservation, and protection of coral reefs throughout the world, and her work has been cited over 33,000 times. Her impact on conservation is incomparable. Now, over the last decade or so, she has started to change the narrative around conservation from doom and gloom to one of possibility through action and intentional change. Her work with the Smithsonian and beyond has led the way to reframing the idea of how we tackle the most important environmental problems we face as a society. We were so very grateful to talk with her and excited to share her story for our first episode of The Possibilists. Thank you so much for tuning in. Let's get straight to our conversation with Dr. Knowlton. Dr. Nancy Knowlton, welcome to The Possibilists. It's really good to talk to you. And I guess we'll start off if you could just introduce yourself and kind of uh, basically, uh, you know, some basics of your background. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Nancy Knowlton. I'm a coral reef scientist by training. I spent many years working first in Jamaica and then in Panama and really around the world doing coral reef biology. Uh, but then increasingly over the last couple of decades, and especially over the last decade, I've spent a lot of time also in the sort of science and conservation communication world. So it's been a long journey for me starting as a basic scientist and then now really caring about uh, what the outside world thinks about what's happening. It's interesting that you, you called it a, a basic scientist. So <laughs> I, I like that term because- <laughs> it's, it's a sciencey sort of term. Maybe it doesn't yeah. mean anything to most people, but sort of like this whole idea of basic science and applied science. Although honestly now, um, there, there's a very gray, fuzzy border between the two. It used to be strict. It used to be uh, a clear-cut distinction a couple of decades ago. Now almost everything is both. Yeah, that was definitely one of the the questions I had. Was uh, you know how how did you make your way into conservation? Because I guess yeah, like you said, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago, there was applied science, basic science, and now it's kind of all merging as like a conservation movement. Like you can't really, it's really hard to be like a coral reef scientist without being in conservation. <laughs> yes. So what, what was it that made that, that, that click for you, you know, the beginning, you know, ahead of your time almost? Well, of course, I've been doing this for a while. I got my graduate degree in the 70s, and I actually started off as a coral reef biologist on the north coast of Jamaica, and in my first trip down there was in 1974. And when I was there initially, the reefs were in at least superficially beautiful state, or at least the coral part of the reefs was in great shape. So if you, the water was crystal clear, and if you looked out, you could just see live coral for, you know, as far as the eye could see. Now we knew even back then that the reefs weren't in perfect condition because, and that's because of what you couldn't see when you were looking out, you couldn't see much in the way of fish, essentially no 
big fish and not even that many small fish. And that's because Jamaica is a, a poor country, especially the North Coast. A lot of people really just fishing to feed themselves and their families. And it doesn't take that much fishing effort to take a, a lot of fish away from a, a reef system, especially when it's kind of just a narrow ribbon that fringes the coast. So in any case, in the 70s, everything looked, it looked, we didn't know any, we didn't know any better to think that, that that disconnect between the corals and the fish was gonna be a problem, but it turned out to be a really big problem and that the health of the fish communities we now realize uh, is really linked to the health of the coral communities. And so in Jamaica, there was a big hurricane in 1980, Hurricane Allen, which did a lot of damage, but then a series of diseases, first of the corals, and then actually of a very important sea urchin uh, that eats seaweeds. Um, and because of the overfishing, that, that sea urchin was really the main defense corals had against the seaweeds. And when that urchin died, and about 95% of them died over the course of just a year and a half, then all of a sudden the entire system was thrown into ecological disarray, if you will. And with nothing to eat the seaweeds, seaweeds grow much faster than corals. And so they just sprouted up like uh, uh, weeds, <laughs> seaweeds literally. And, uh, and it's, eventually they smothered most of the living corals. So we went from a situation of about 70% of the bottom being covered with live coral to about 10, less than 10% of the bottom. So I think anyone who witnesses that kind of dramatic change, and it was so quick, it was less than a decade overall, you know, in a sense, those are the seeds of being a conservation biologist, even if you don't necessarily act on it right away. That's, yeah, that's really interesting. I actually, in 2010, actually did my, uh, Peace Corps service in Jamaica. Huh. I was actually in the, the, the south, the very as south as you can get in Jamaica, down in the Portland Bight, Clarendon area. Um, and you know, you're you're right. It's such a diverse and I don't intense place culturally, <laughs> and on top of ecologically. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just such a uh, I don't even I don't even know how to describe it. But I wasn't there for for the whole two years. But it it was. It it really taught me a lot about uh, conservation in you know outside of the U.S. It tells you, I mean, it makes you realize that uh, people are dependent on healthy ecosystems, but also that the solutions have to be ones that people can live with uh, in the immediate sense. I mean, it's no good to tell somebody who's fishing to feed their family that week that if you do this for five years, things will get better. You have to have solutions that that. Uh, make it possible for people to adopt them uh, over that period where they need to, to work in order to have big positive effects. Yeah, I'm reminded of something I, um, I saw on one of your talks, just you said it like on the, on the local scale, this kind of conservation work is not rocket science. But when you kind of expand it out, it get, becomes more and more complex. And it actually is about as complex as rocket science. Um, <laughs> And you know when you're telling a community, hey, you're you got to change the way you're fishing. It seems so simple, but even though it's not rocket science, it is way more complex than that. <laughs> Actually, I spent. I mean, really, I used to always tell my students that you know conservation is about changing the behavior of people, not changing the behavior of whales. And the behavior of people is definitely rocket science um, in the sense that we're still learning a lot about what what underpins the the way people act, why they make the decisions they do. Um, and it's complicated. It's really complicated. So I guess to, to kind of take a step back, um, you know, you said your graduate work was in tropical coral reefs in the, the Caribbean. What was it that drew you to the coral reefs? You know, it obviously, it, you know, it's pretty, there's a lot of fish, diversity, it sounds cool, but what was it that made you go, yeah, that, that this is this is what I want to do? Well, initially, um, uh, well, I come from New England, so I, I worked um, for a year after I graduated from college, I worked for a wonderful woman named Ruth Turner, pioneer deep sea biologist at a time when it's really hard for women to be marine biologists. They were, women weren't even allowed on research vessels. Um, there was a lot of discrimination against women. Anyway, she was the person who got me inspired to work in the ocean. And I even got learned to dive uh, when I was working uh, with her, not so much for the work per se, but just because I was inspired by what she 
what she was doing. So that was Massachusetts. I learned to dive in really cold water. And, uh, and then I moved to Berkeley to do my graduate work. I wasn't really sure I wanted what I wanted to do, but I really liked the, the interests of the people in the department at the time I applied. So I thought I knew I could find something that would be interesting. Uh, but, and so I went out to California and learned how to uh, be a science diver, which is a, sort of a higher level of certification than just being a, a diver as a tourist. And that water was also really cold. So, I, and then I, the first year I went to Friday Harbor where the, in Washington where the water's so cold that your hands ache after about 10 seconds. So I spent a lot of time in cold water. And when the opportunity to take a course on coral reef biology uh, uh, sort of went uh, across my radar, I said, oh, this sounds interesting. So I went to, to take this course. It was a biology and geology of coral reefs. So it's run by a group called the Organization for Tropical Studies. and. Uh, that's uh, where the first time I'd ever seen anything even remotely like a coral reef. And I was just hooked right from the beginning, from the first dive. One of the things that I, I discovered in doing some research about your work um, was the census of marine life. Um, it seems as if you were one of the few leaders in um, creating that. And you know, it was about a decade long, as I understand, uh, uh, effort to kind of create a baseline for what is in the ocean. How did that come about? What was it that motivated the, you and the, the, your group of leaders to uh, conduct that census? Well, you know, I'm going to uh, have to, to some extent correct the impression that I was responsible for creating the census because I really wasn't. Um, it was uh, sort of the branch, brainchild of a marine biologist um, and, uh, and a funder at the Rockefeller um, at Rockefeller University who worked for the Sloan Foundation. And they got together and said, you know, wouldn't it, I mean, I, it was actually the idea of the biologists, you know, we, we really need a census of everything in the ocean, we don't have it. And so they, they joined with other people and then the end result, um, and I, as I say, I wasn't around even for the, the census ran from about 2000 to 2010. And I was certainly aware of the census, but I actually didn't become part of it until 2005 when sort of halfway through the census, they, um, recognized that they really needed a census of coral reefs. The, the, pro, the census was organized a bun, around a bunch of different projects, a couple in the deep sea, um, uh, vent communities, the continental slope and the abyss, some of them around tracking fish, um, some of them um, around the Arctic and the Antarctic, one around microbes, and they, they didn't all start at the same time. So there was a meeting uh, in the middle of the census talking about what we weren't looking at. And of course, I was the only coral reef biologist in the room and they looked at me and they said, don't you think we should do a census of coral reefs? And I uh, said, well, yeah, probably since up something like a quarter to a third of everything that lives in the ocean is associated with reefs. So it started, um, it started actually kind of late in the game. When you think about it, there's no way you can census everything that lives on coral reefs, even in 10 years, certainly not five. And so what we tried to do uh, for the census was figure out methods that would speed up the discovery process. And, and that's really what the project was for the coral reef part of the census. We developed these little structures or plates of sort of uh, PVC plates that are stacked up with little spacers. They're like underwater apartment houses or condominiums. And we put them out on coral reefs around the world and, and uh, studied what grew in them over the course of a year or two. And that's a really nice technique because it's very standardized and you can do it anywhere. Actually, you can do it places that aren't even coral reefs. It's, it's really a good way of, of studying all the tiny diversity that's hidden in the cracks and crevices of the seafloor, which is actually as it turns out where most of the diversity lies. On coral reefs, we go to a coral reef with a scuba tank and you pay a lot of attention to the, to the corals and the fishes, but actually most of the species are the things that you can't see. But at the end of the census, the other thing I was involved in was writing a popular book. Uh, it was called, uh, we wound up being called Citizens of the Sea. Um, and um, it was published by National Geographic. It still actually does pretty well, I'm very proud to say. And it was uh, the story, not just of the things we discovered in the census, but just, I use it as an opportunity to tell cool stories about everything that lives in the ocean that I've been accumulating in my head for decades. And then I got them into a, you know, a little under a hundred stories that, um, uh, that I use to sort of tell the story of how the ocean works and all the, crazy wild things that ocean creatures do that you might never think of otherwise. 
in doing research, I, I read something that where I'm not sure if you guys called yourself this or if someone else called you this, but you and your husband were, were named uh, Dr. Gloom and Dr. Doom. <laughs> is that, was that correct? <laughs> it, it's, um, it is true that uh, my husband and I both spent decades and decades talking about what was going on with coral reefs and the ocean in general. I mean, we saw, we were, I actually met my husband uh, in, when that first summer where I took us uh, that summer course in 1974. And uh, so we both watched together the reefs of Jamaica go down the tubes. And then of course that, that process of the kind of loss of reefs didn't, wasn't limited to the, to the North coast of Jamaica. It became, uh, those diseases, uh, that did so much damage were Caribbean wide. And then of course they weren't the only things killing coral reefs on the, in the Pacific, it, there were uh, outbreaks of chromothorn starfish. And, um, and so there were all these problems with coral reefs. And then of course there's a widening recognition and my husband uh, named Jeremy Jackson played a major role in pointing to overfishing as the primary culprit in the decline of so, so many different marine ecosystems, not just coral reefs. And so between the two of us, we did spend a lot of time giving lectures about the, the, the terrible things that were happening to the ocean. Jeremy has a TED talk, how we wrecked the ocean, which is really, really upsetting, been viewed well over a million times. And, uh, and he outlines all the different things that we've done. And, and so, but, so yes, we were called doctors doom and gloom. And I was on that kind of doom and gloom path for a really, really long time. And it wasn't until I moved to the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And so when we got there, there was a lot of opportunity. It was, there was, it was kind of an open invitation for new ideas. And uh, having spent all these decades, both, uh, um, studying the reefs of Jamaica and then also seeing what was going on in Panama and coral bleaching and all this other stuff, the overfishing problem. Uh, we launched um, something called the Center for Marine Biodiversity and Conservation along with Enrique Sala, who's now at National Geographic. So the three of us decided we wanted to, it wasn't there was no conservation going on at Scripps. Actually, there's a lot of conservation, but the really the whole wasn't bigger than the sum of its parts. And so we created this center to bring it together under a virtual umbrella so that people would pay attention to it and recognize the connections. And part of the process was the, uh, the creation of a, a whole graduate program, which we were, the National Science Foundation funded. And it was very interdisciplinary. It involved not just biologists, but also uh, people studying climate, physical scientists, but, and not just science, natural scientists, but also economists, anthropologists, even some people in communication and the art. So it was deliberately very interdisciplinary. And part of that was to get everybody sort of having a common, at least some, some shared words, if not an entirely fluent common language, uh, uh, we had a summer program which, where we present the basics. And uh, that, that was actually Jeremy's responsibility. He created that program. And, um, and so we would always begin it. Uh, this was in about 2000 and or so, um, we'd always begin it with the state of the ocean. Well, you can imagine how cheerful those lectures were <laughs> given what we'd been doing for the past several decades. And, um, and we just would blast the students with all of the grim statistics about what was happening to the ocean. I think the idea was, oh, um, they really need to know how bad things are so they'll work extra hard. Uh, at fixing them or something. I guess that was sort of in the back of our minds. It just seemed the logical way to start. But um, as I started, as we did this over a year, you know, summer after summer after summer, I got this sort of sense of the students not necessarily being um, inspired by what the information we were presenting, but more being depressed. And I, and I started thinking about, you know, this was really medical school for the ocean. So, but in medical school, you don't train students to write obituaries of their patients, even though, of course, they all wind up with obituaries, but that's not what medical school is about. Medical is about, school is about keeping people healthy and making them healthy when they're sick. So if this was medical school for the ocean, why were we spending so much time training our students to write ever more refined obituaries of the ocean and the planet at large? So um, that's where the idea of having 
uh, symposia around success stories originated was this concept of moving beyond the obituaries. And so the first one was actually held at the Smithsonian because uh, by, uh, by the end of 2007, I'd actually moved to the Natural History Museum at the Smithsonian. And we held the symposium in 2009 associated with the first International Marine Conservation Congress. And it was a whole day symposium. And I can remember somebody writing me and saying, how could you possibly have a whole day on success stories? There aren't that many success stories out there. And in the end, there were so many success stories um, that we had to limit everyone to about six minutes. And, uh, and people came up to me afterwards and, uh, and to other people as well and said, this has, this has changed the way I think about conservation. This is, gonna, this, is, this is changing the way I do my research and it's gonna change the way I teach. And so that was really the beginning of the whole optimism effort uh, was the idea that, you know, yes, there were huge problems, but also there were some solutions and not only solutions, there were actually things that were already working that if we could do more of them, it would be a, a good thing. And yet on the other hand, most of these solutions and success stories were very poorly known, even by the people in the, in, in the marine conservation field, people, professionals in the area. So we had a couple more um, of these symposia. And then uh, sometime a couple of years later, I was contacted by a woman named Ellen Kelsey, who, uh, who is a, uh, works in marine conservation, very concerned about environmental depression in children. And she said, you know, we're on the same page here. We're just working independently. Why don't we get together a group of like-minded people and see uh, what we can do to make this bigger, another sort of make the whole greater than some of its parts effort. And so we had a small workshop, uh, Ellen and I, and also Heather Coldaway at the Zoological Society of London and uh, uh, Elizabeth Whitebread. And we had a, a tiny little workshop, 14 people, I think, in total on, uh, north of London. And, at the, and so we spent the weekend brainstorming about various aspects of, um, of how to make the, this sort of, how to change the conservation conversation, if you will, to something that was more than just doom and gloom. And, um, and so at the end we thought, well, let's have a, maybe we should have a Twitter campaign. This was back in the days when Twitter was not quite as uh, popular, but it was still basically uh, chugging along pretty well. So we went back to our home bases and then we voted by email as to what the hashtag would be. And, the winner was hashtag ocean optimism, I think in part because of the, the nice alliterative sound of the ocean optimism. So we launched it, we didn't have any budget. It was just, you know, we launched it right before World Oceans Day in 2014 and, um, and just wrote to our friends and colleagues and said, hey, if you know of a good success story, write about it on Twitter and use this hashtag. And that's how it started. Now it's been, it, and it really spread like wildfire for a, particularly when you can say that there was no financial backing or organized professional PR campaign. It was just, it was a reflection of the fact that people were so hungry for success that they really were interested in, in seeing these examples. And uh, now I think the hashtag has been used by 45,000 different um, Twitter accounts. And, and, uh, and, it's, and it remains the case that if you're trying to find good news about the ocean. If you just go look for hashtag ocean optimism on Twitter, you can usually find something you didn't know about. That's what I find really remarkable is to me is that I spend my life now looking for these success stories. And, and nevertheless, I'm still learning every day I learn about something I didn't know about. This led to, uh, by then I was at the, at the Smithsonian, as I, as I mentioned, and um, the, conservation community at the Smithsonian was much like the conservation community at Scripps, looking for a way to bring people together. And so I told the story of, of hashtag ocean optimism and what it had done. And that was really the spark that lit the earth optimism effort at the Smithsonian. That, that idea, that shift is something that we're really, really interested in because what we ended up doing is, you know, when you said about this book, you, you said, I just kind of wanted to tell these cool stories about a hundred cool stories. And that's <clears throat> basically what we did too, is, you know, when I was kind of coming up in my career and just kind of a jaded biologist, as I got more and more into it, I started meeting 
people that were they had worked on rare plants for 25 years. They were, you know, dead set on recovering the Stevens kangaroo rat. And when you when you start meeting those people, you start to realize that these people are literally everywhere. And that that was basically the same thing. Is like we just wanted to tell these stories because we met these people and they were actually really cool people and they had really interesting stories. All of these people that you're mentioning, the saving the desert rat or a butterfly or uh, you know, whatever, or working on climate or trying to develop a biodegradable solutions for the plastics problem. All of those are quintessential examples of the hero's journey. Uh, and uh, so they really lend themselves to storytelling and to not take advantage of that when people process stories and stories stick with people in a way that, that facts just don't. So you really, so the, the whole idea of telling the stories of these successes, I think is absolutely critical. So I really commend what you're doing. I think it's fantastic. Well, yeah, well, thank you. We're, we're trying our best. The, that, like, like we said, that, that click where you go from, I'm working in conservation and everything is you know, depressing to going, okay, how do we change that narrative? You know, we're calling it the possibilism uh, based off of the Michael Soule quote, uh, you know, just to recap it, he said, when people ask if I'm po uh, optimistic or pessimistic, I say I'm possibilistic. And one of the things we're trying to do with this new series is explore what that means, <laughs> you know, because we think we know what it means. We know what it means to us, but with all of your, your decades of actual conservation work and collaborative work in, in trying to tell stories, um, what does that, what does that mean to you? <laughs> well, it, it means, uh, I really love that quote, by the way, and I love the concept um, because it's very, sometimes, and sometimes when people hear the concept of hear about the concept of ocean optimism or earth optimism they worry that it's very pollyanna it's just talking about all the good news and uh sweeping the bad news under the rug and that's certainly not the intention of these efforts uh sometimes people there it's actually been this kind of the role of these um these kind of attitudinal structures has been studied quite a lot by social scientists and they and they've actually found that what they what they sometimes call constructive positivism um, or constructive optimism uh, rather than unrealistic optimism or doom and gloom pessimism is often the best way forward in terms of people's keeping people motivated to do what they're doing and also getting other people engaged. So I think po the possibilistic uh, framing is, is very similar to that idea of constructive optimism, sort of recognizing that there are big problems, not trying to to diminish them, but also uh, talk about what can be done about them. Because one, the other, the other big thing that science, that social scientists have definitely discovered uh, over the course of decades, and and really conservation scientists, I think, were in, came to this rather late in the game. But uh, the the realization that if you present really big problems to people, and but you don't provide any solutions, it leads to apathy, not action. It just does. People would rather go to the bar. If they rather, rather than think too hard about a problem that's horrible and they can do nothing about it. Thank you so much for speaking to all of that it, because it is. I, I think you're very right that I think a lot of conservationists have, are I think are are just now starting to play with these ideas um, and, and even putting words to it is very difficult because it does almost feel wrong. It almost feels. Um, you're not supposed to talk about, it. you're not supposed to talk about, uh, you know, these successes, or you're not supposed to talk about, yeah, there is hope. And I, I think you have a quote that I, I, I absolutely love is um, another key ingredient for major change is hope. After all, Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, I have a dream, not I have a problem. And I absolutely love that. Um, which is so ironic, because when you do get criticized, and we've actually been criticized as well for having this, you know, pushing this. It's ironic, though, because you have been a frontline worker in conservation your whole career, um, you know, working with the corals. You're, see you're the one that's seeing all the negative. You're the one seeing and working with all the terrible stuff. And I, I know for Austin and myself and others that we've worked with, it does have a psychological toll. And, and we do have to reconcile with that. And it's very challenging and it's very difficult to, 
have a profession in an industry that is so focused on the crisis discipline. Um, so there's so many aspects to it that there's a hope aspect. How can we go forward? Um, that this stuff actually does work. Like if we actually can make this kind of science happen, it actually does work. And then there's a complete paradigm shift when you start paying attention to the optimism or the possibilism or whatever, you start to see more and more. And I don't know, I don't know if there's a question in there or not, but maybe, um, you know, some of your own reflections with those different perceptions of, of opening yourself up to seeing optimism. Well, it's certainly the case that I, I, all of us who work on this uh, get pushback. Uh, you're not alone. I get pushback. I, I don't think I ever give a talk on ocean optimism or earth optimism without there being a question, don't you think it's a bad idea to talk about what's working because it will make people less engaged? And it's actually a legitimate issue if you don't um, frame it properly. In other words, if you uh, if you make people feel that the problem is solved, then they actually are less engaged. So you do, that's why it's so critical uh, to uh, to make sure. I, I usually it's it's a it's a really there's a an art to the balance. I mean, the other thing is that negative news tends to be much stickier than positive news. So even if you say spend fifty percent of your time on negative news and fifty percent of your time on positive news, people will remember the negative news. So if you want people to remember the positive news, you have to sort of frame it with the reality check. I, I usually do it at the beginning and the end of every talk, but then I spend most of my time talking about the positive examples so that they stick because otherwise they just get washed away in the sense that there's nothing we can do. And I still, I mean, I'll, I saved uh, for perpetuity an email I received from a very famous uh, conservation ecologist who said, uh, he copied me, I'm sure he knew what he was doing. And he said, uh, uh, people who participate in optimism events should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> that was his framing, that's what he said. And, and I, there are certainly people that, um, uh, who still feel that you know you shouldn't talk about the successes, um, but on the other hand, this it's so clear that you have to talk about the successes in order to get people, lots of people, to engage to create more of them. So I just you know I acknowledge that you have to be careful, and I, but I but I refuse to to let that turn into a situation where you can only talk about the bad news because social science does not support the idea that all that you should just talk about the bad news and that will solve the problem. It will not solve the problem. We, we've been talking about the bad news for decades <laughs> and look where we are. And, um, and I think what's really interesting is that even, uh, it's not just, this is this kind of effort to sort of sh shine a spotlight on what's working is not limited to academia. Um, if you look at, there's a whole field of journalism called solutions journalism. And if you, if you read the major papers of the New York Times or the Washington Post, they, they have features that are focused on solutions. So I think there's a widespread recognition now, not just within academics, but also just sort of professional communication uh, in the broadest sense that we, that although it's true, you know, the, the standard saying, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. I mean, it's true that bad news gets people's attention and tends to dominate your mental space, but if, but it's not true that that means that the best way forward for conservation is to simply talk about the bad news. So when you uh, give these talks, maybe to the public or when we were allowed to give public talks, um, and people ask you, or say they, they say they do get inspired by the, the the positive stories. And when they ask you, "Hey, that's really cool. What can I do? What, what do I do about it?" Uh, what is your typical answer to those kind of people? Uh, that's actually, you know, I uh, I think that's one of the reasons that I started turning strongly to the solution to to trying to figure out the solutions side of the picture because I would routinely get that question, including from nine-year-olds in the audience brought there by their mother or father, um, you know, they wants to answer the question. I'll never forget uh, a little nine-year-old asking me exactly that question after I'd given a very gloomy talk about coral reefs at the at uh, Marine Biological Labs in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. He said, well, what can I do? <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, and I, and in a way, when I initially, um, I was kind of flummoxed by the 
question. I, you know, because it's because the problems do seem so huge. You know, what do you tell people? It doesn't seem trivial. So, um, you know, I think there are, you know, there are a number of different, and it depends on the person, of course, and their age and what their inclination is. I, I always tell people to begin with some, you know, looking for what you really care about and and where you feel like you can make a difference. Um, you know, to sort of try to, you can't solve all the problems at once. So choose a problem. You can always choose another problem later, but, you know, choose a problem. And then, um, and then I often say, you know, you, it's really important. I think it's personally important to, to sort of do things in my personal sphere. Um, it's not, it's, it's knowing full well that it per se is a drop in the proverbial bucket. So I try to, uh, act in a way, you know, for example, I eat very little meat now. I really think about travel. There are all sorts of things I try to do to have a lifestyle that's compatible uh, with what I say. I know that I fail uh, big time um, in terms of still making a bigger mess of the planet by my actions than, than I would like, but it's a start. But that's, that's really just sort of a way of sort of setting your personal place in order, then you really need to work outside what you can do personally. Uh, Catherine Hayhoe, who is the new, will, will soon be the new uh, chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy, I sit on the National Board of the Nature Conservancy, always says that, um, in her talks about climate change that she's a, she works, uh, she's a climate change scientist, but also very, very, very influential in climate communication. She said, the most important thing you can do about climate change is talk about it. So um, I think that's, and I think that's true. I think, you know, talking to your friends, your family, and of course, talking about it in the, when you vote, <laughs> you know, vote, you know, vote with uh, an understanding and appreciation for what the environmental policies are, the people you're voting for. So um, those are all things that you can do really easily. And then there's a question of, you know, what more can I get involved in a specific effort? And there, there, there are so many opportunities. It depends on where you live, and as I say, what you, where, what you most care about. Um, one of the things that I think is important about telling these stories is that people learn about possibilities of where they might want to get engaged. But as you mentioned, that no matter where you live, there are people working in this, you know, on conservation problems. And so you can seek out something local and small scale, or you can reach out to you know a bigger operation it really depends on this on this kind of action you feel most comfortable taking and then you can start small and get bigger so they're working with the groups of people you can do a lot more than you can do working by yourself but i but i always feel it's important to, to begin inside and then move outside um and then get as move outside as far and, and as fast as you can I love that. I love that so much. Oh, um, but just to everything that you said, Dr. Knowlton, just now, um, I'm starting to see even just in this conversation, but also, you know, part of the larger dialogue, maybe there is that also, there is that other connection where how we were talking about earlier, when you're a kid or when you're, in, you're early in your life and you, you get that sense of wonder of corals or peregrines or whatever it is, and you, you know, that nature wonder. One of the things that I'm starting to see, and I think Paul Hawkins writes about this in his Blessed Unrest, is this idea of you know people coming together um, in these de decentralized ways. One of maybe the new ways that we can also get wonder is the trouble of all the conservation issues. All these different problems around the world mean that there are actually wonderful opportunities to actually fix all kinds of incredible things. And so, whether you're a marine biologist fixing, you know, all the corals in the world or, or like Austin, uh, you know, saving an endangered butterfly, or maybe you're just doing a trash cleanup and you actually get to like pick up the trash in your neighborhood or in your local wetland or whatever, and you get to fix species habitat. You get to take care of somebody, another species home. I mean, that is its own sense of wonder and whatever that manifests, you know, so if you're talking to that nine-year-old kid saying, what can I do? It's almost, what do you get to do? <laughs> and kind of changing the narrative in that way. Yes, actually. Yeah. I mean, you're sort of, I mean, in a way you can be overwhelmed with oppor opportunities rather than sort of desperately searching for one. 
uh, which is good. I mean, it's not good in the sense that there's so many problems, but it's good in the sense that you shouldn't have trouble finding something you really, really want to contribute to. And I, I do think it's really important. Um, I mean, there are a couple of mottos I often leave people with um, in addition to focusing on the positive. So one is um, uh, uh, a quote from Bill Gates who says, we always uh, overestimate the amount of change that will take place in two years and underestimate the amount of change that will take place in 10 years. And that's really important. Changes can now happen really, really fast, but it sometimes feels like it's not happening at all. And then, and then suddenly it takes off. And so I think it's really important for people who are working in conservation to, to keep that kind of nonlinear trajectory in mind, realizing it may seem like nothing's happening, nothing's happening, nothing's happening, but it's very likely that when things start to happen and it will be sooner than you realize, uh, then it will really take off in a positive way. And we've seen that with so many social change movements in the last uh, decade or so. And the same is true with conservation. Um, and the other thing that I think is really important, and this is um, often a problem with people who first get engaged in something, is a, it's, a, it's a saying from Voltaire, which is, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And I really think that's important because conservation is a, you know, it's a two step forward, one step back, or sometimes it's a one step forward, 10 step back uh, enterprise. And you, and it's, and there's never, a per, it's never really perfect. And it, and even when you solve one problem, you don't ever solve it forever. You've solved it for the time being. So you just recognize that that's just sort of, that's, that is how conservation works and celebrate what's working be concerned and uh, tackle the things that's not working, but don't throw up your hands and say, this is hopeless just because something doesn't go your way. I think that's really important as well. And then the, and then working with groups, I think is, you know, I think there's a reason, for example, that the, it's like the AIDS quill were so powerful. It's the idea that this kind of, this collective action is really inspiring to people. And so I, and, unless, you know, somebody's really a hermit by nature, I do encourage them to reach out and work with other people because it's it's a way of sort of building your confidence and your sense that change is possible and change is happening. And it's a very motivating experience, not trying to do it all by yourself. And I think I just conclude by saying that there are a ton of success stories out there and, um, and take some time to find them every day. I make a, I have a policy that I, I don't really start my day until I've found some piece of good news to, to take me through the day. And, and the fact that if I can find all of these successes, um, and um, even though I do this almost at this point full-time for a living, it's, there are so many successes out there that you don't know about. So uh, this is, and your project is really bringing some of them to life, but you can't possibly, just like, uh, when I said, you know, scientists can't easily just quickly describe all the different species on the planet. Well, uh, conservation biologists actually, despite all the problems, can't begin to talk about all the different successes and solutions that are out there. So, sit, so take some time to, to look for them and find them and, and study them and, and be inspired by them. And they're, they're a source of joy. I, um, I was just one of our partners in this at the Smithsonian is the Cambridge Conservation Initiative. And they just ran an Earth Optimism Project uh, sort of event that just just is just wrapping up or just wrapped up this weekend. And I watched a lot of the uh, examples on that uh, that were broadcast. And there is this wonderful story about the recovery of the great blue butterfly in in Britain, uh, which turned out was desperately dependent on an ant that it used in part of its life cycle, but no one realized that. So the scientists were key to really figuring out what needed to be done to, to, to save the species. And then there is a film, uh, which I think you can watch on, um, on Amazon Prime called Stuck on a Rock, but they had a, a live screening of it. But the amazing story of, um, of this stick insect that uh, was saved from Low Lord Howe Island. It was discovered on a, it was extinct on the island, but it was discovered by rock climbers on this rock that juts out of the Pacific Ocean near New Zealand. And now it's being captive bred in a variety of places around the world. And they've gotten rid of the rats on Lord Howe Island, which is what 
you know, cause this insect to go extinct in the first place. And so they'll probably be reintroducing it in the not too distant future. And then think about all the past successes we've had. We got rid of DDT and, and where I live in Maine, um, uh, the ocean is, you know, the shoreline is dripping with bald eagles. And the reason it's dripping with bald eagles is because we got rid of DDT, we did something. And uh, similarly on a global scale, it's the ozone hole was this huge problem. Uh, we passed uh, regulations and, and created international treaties to get rid of the chemicals that were causing it. And now it's likely to be gone by the middle of the century. I mean, there are so, so, so many examples. Some of them are so successful that we've actually sort of forgotten about them. Um, because as I say, there are bald eagles everywhere and people have lost track of the fact that the reason they're there is because we did something. And similarly in Maine, really right around the corner from my house, people are taking down old dams and the alewives are coming back into the streams, uh, going up streams that were blocked by these dams before and lots and lots of communities are involved in the process of restoring these rivers. And it's not just in Maine, it's everywhere. I mean, there are, no matter where you look, there are people making a difference. So um, just take your pick and pick more than one if you're so inspired. We totally agree with you. I mean. That's exactly why we named, why Austin named this group Pelicanus. It's named after the California brown pelican that in 2009 was delisted. That's the whole point. Exactly. And just like you said, you know, if you start paying attention, that was one of the things that um, was so shocking to me. I started my own practice probably about seven years ago where I started collecting conservation news just for myself. And I just started collecting different headlines. Um, and it shocked me. How many not doom and gloom? I won't say positive. I won't necessarily say optimistic, but just not doom and gloom. Just that. Just the fact that there is work being done. It astounded me how many there actually are. And that's what led to our um, creating our second podcast, which is Pelicanus News. And so every two weeks, we just share five to 10 uh, headlines of just what we found. And it's remarkable. We've been doing this for almost a little over a year, so probably 15 months now. And it's astounding. And we didn't expect that. We just did not expect that. And when you start looking at it, it really kind of does shock you. And it's again, it's not to be Pollyanna about the world. It's not to have rose colored glasses by any means. We're very, very aware of the challenges. But when you do pay attention, it does shock you. Yeah, I mean, um, I there was a study done by a colleague of mine, Jennifer Jaquette, who showed that for the ocean, she, the study was limited to ocean news. Actually, there are lots of success stories out there. The problem is the way we process information, we remember the bad, the big bad stories, and we forget the small good ones. And even though there are lots and lots of them, uh, and uh, the result is that we don't, we just, we just don't, we lose we lose track of what the positive things are because we become fixated on the negative news. Now, it's probably true that when we were evolving, um, it made, you know, as a life and death, if there's bad news on the horizon, you really need to pay attention to it. Uh, so, I mean, it makes sense that our brains are focused on bad news because those are, and, and scary things, because that's what we have to, in you know, our life, our lives used to depend on. Actually, our lives depend on it now. We need to pay attention to climate change. But, um, but it, it, it means that that coupled with a news cycle, which is any story has a pretty short legs. I mean, it only, it's only floating around for a couple of days and then it disappears. Um, so that if you don't remember it, then, um, then it's gonna be gone. In fact, I can, I sometimes, one of the reasons I tweet positive, I mean, I treat positive stories to share them. But the other thing is that that way I can go back and find them because they're so, you know, they're otherwise, they, they come and go and they're hard to track down. Um, I think my, best example of how, uh, how crazy our, our, even for conservation professionals, how crazy our inability to keep track of what's happening in a positive framing was, at least traditionally, was uh, there is a story that came out now about, about four years ago that Tampa Bay um, had solved its pollution problem and as a result, the seagrasses, which had been terribly ruined by all this pollution and the cloudy water that resulted, uh, now the seagrasses were back to 1950s levels. So that's a huge success story. And uh, what was really striking to me is that I, 
I would mention it to people and including people, professionals in the marine conservation uh, science, also major donors, and no one had even heard of it. And um, I was even giving a talk at a, a meeting that was dedicated to the, um, the, the biology and conservation of the Gulf of Mexico. And it was, the meeting was in Tampa. And so was the, there were about 200 people in the room. They were all working on the Gulf of Mexico. And I said to them, because uh, I was giving my ocean optimism talk, I said, you know, how many of you know the story of uh, what's happened in Tampa Bay and the recovery of seagrasses? So the 200 people in the room, four people raised their hands. So I, you know, I was just like flabbergasted. So I think the really one of the most uh, positive things that's come out of this greater focus on what's working is that I don't think I can, it's less and less the case that that happens to me now. I mean, it's not just that I've run around the world told, telling everyone the story of Tampa Bay, which of course I do, but, um, but it's also that I think people really are paying attention to successes. And, and that's why, you know, that's why the, the project that you have is so important because it allows people to find them. But people I think are now more primed to remember what's working and not simply be, um, just overwhelmed by doom and gloom, but it's taken it's taken a decade for people to get to that point. And it, but it's it's there now, and it's really important to take advantage of the fact that people now are really interested in hearing about the about what's working and how to make more of it. So uh, congratulations to you too for what you're doing. It's really important, and I look forward to tweeting about your posts on a regular basis. Well, thank you. I it's. Everything you're sharing is so lovely, and and it is. It's part of it, you know. Giving ourselves permission to, as a, as a humanity, to figure out what we're trying to do with conservation, and and to accept when we have made achievements, but also recognizing that we're we're on a larger path, and we're trying to figure out who we are as humans on this planet as well. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much, Dr. Knowlton. This has been. Truly amazing. And we are inspired by the conservation work you've done. And we are really just following your lead when it comes to the earth optimism uh, reframing. And we're so very happy to talk with you today. It's my huge pleasure to be with you. And I, I am a big, big believer in what you're doing. And I wish you all the success in the world. Thank you very much to Dr. Knowlton for talking with us. We are grateful to her for sharing her time to talk with us about something so important to all of us. Check out the Smithsonian Earth Optimism website for more information and inspiring stories in conservation. Producers on this episode are Austin and Taylor Parker, Kat Coots, and Andrea Santi. Music for this episode was provided by a Picture Book Studios. You can find all of our podcasts at pelicanus.org. Please like, subscribe, and comment on our page if you haven't already. Thanks again for tuning in. Talk to you next time. Thank you.